Hi, plant friends. I'm so excited to share this episode on ferns with you. But before that, I want to share a big announcement and invitation to be on an episode of Bloom and Grow Radio. Next week is episode 100. We've got a whole lot of celebrations going on, but I want to feature you on our 100th episode. I am going to be talking about the top 10 things I've learned from 100 episodes of Learning with Bloom and Grow. And I would love to invite our community to participate in that. I would love to hear from you what your favorite favorite episode of Bloom and Grow Radio has been and how it helped you or what is the number one thing you've learned from listening to an episode of the show. All of the instructions for you to participate are in the show notes. It is beyond easy. You literally just call a phone number and leave a message for me and that will submit you to potentially be featured on next week's episode. There is a very short turnaround. Tomorrow is the deadline. So please take a look at those instructions. Give me a call and share what you've learned. I think the episode is going to be awesome. All right, you know the drill. Plant friends, we're at episode 99 of Boom and Grow Radio. Oh man, episode 99, here we are. Episode 100 is around the corner, plant friends, and I am planning an epic week of celebrations for you and for us because the more I think about this, I'm so proud of myself for getting here to 100 episodes, but I'm really just thankful and proud of this community. You know, three years ago, I started Bloom and Grow. I had no idea that we would ever get to 100 episodes, but this is all truly a testament to this community, how you guys have supported me and how we have all learned together. I mean, we've all learned something in this three-year process. So I want to let you know I'm going to be having an epic celebration week over on my Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. We're going to have a huge giveaway next week. It's going to go live next Friday, celebrating all of our sponsors that we've had, and they've all contributed some really amazing things. So make sure that you're following my Instagram next week because I want you to participate in the giveaway and get all of these amazing products you've heard me talk about. And also, I've invited some of our favorite and most downloaded guests from the 100 episode selection to join me for IG Lives at 1130 Eastern Time every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of next week. I'm going to have all of my favorite plant friends like Leslie Halleck, Alessia from Apartment Botanist, and even more. And I invite you guys to join us on these lives to ask your questions, and I'll do my best to ask them to our guests. It's going to be super fun and casual, but another way to celebrate this amazing community that has grown up around this podcast. It's all happening on Instagram, so make sure you're following me at Bloom and Grow Radio. Speaking of community, thank you so much to our Patreon plant friends, the newest ones, Cassandra Marie Tenorio, Jessica McWilliams, and Michael Perez. We always have a couple of new plant friends trickling in each week, and I'm so thankful for all of you. If you're interested in supporting this community, you can click the link in the show notes to the Bloom and Grow Patreon to learn more. Plan friends, we invite Lisa from Houseplant Guru back for her third episode today, all about ferns. Lisa is a crazy fern lady, and we have talked about the fact that I am the opposite of a crazy fern lady, and she requested long ago to be my fern guest. So I'm so thankful that we had a really amazing conversation about all things ferns and how to keep them alive. And you hear about the ferns that I have not kept alive and why in the conversation. I'm going to let the conversation speak for itself. But holy moly, it's great. And we talk about a lot of different types of ferns and some several links. So they're all linked in the show notes, including the link to Lisa's new book, Houseplant Party. So I'm keeping the intro short and sweet. Check me out next week for the celebration. Make sure to call in and share that. I would love to hear from you if you want to call in and be a part of the 100th episode. You only have 24 hours left to feature it. I've been emailing you guys all week about it. So last chance, final reminder, if you want to be featured on the 100th episode of Bloom and Grow Radio to share your favorite episode or your favorite lesson learned, please check out the show notes for instructions and give me a call and leave me a message. All right, let's get Fernie. Thank you, Territorial Seed Company, for sponsoring today's episode. 
Territorial Seed Company is a family-owned and operated business that's been offering tried, tested, and successfully harvested seeds and plants for 40 years. They are no joke plant friends. Territorial Seed Company aims to enable gardeners to be more self-sufficient, providing everything necessary to grow bountiful and healthful, delicious food year-round. And when they say everything, they mean everything because they have over 2,000 varieties of vegetables, fruits, herbs, and flowers to choose from. So plant friends, I know spring gets all the hype for outdoor gardeners, but did you know that in most regions, fall is an amazing time to harvest delicious vegetables and other plants that you can harvest later in the fall or even over winter and harvest next spring? Territorial Seed Company has the only fall winter seed catalog that is focused on growing cooler weather plants. They specialize in this. They know what they're talking about, and they carry a special selection of vegetables and herb seeds that are perfect to start in the summer or early fall and harvest in the late fall, winter, or even over winter. So these plants include brassicas, root crops, lettuce, and green onions, and every Italian's favorite, garlic. So plant friends, did you know that you plant garlic in the fall and then you overwinter it and then you actually harvest it that following spring or summer? Territorial Seed Company is known for its garlic selection. I think they have over 20 varieties. And after learning this, the Italian in me is so excited to try growing their garlic garlic for the first time this year. What impresses me about Territorial Seed Company is that it's run by gardeners and farmers that have a deep and intentional commitment to their community to supply the best, most hardy seeds for their customers. They have a 75-acre certified organic and biodynamic research farm where they assess all the seeds and plants they sell for robustness, vigor, taste, and nutrition. And they actually produce 25% of the seeds that they sell on their farm. And then for the other 75%, they grow in test all of those other seeds before offering it to our community. They sell us what they would grow themselves in their gardens, and that is awesome. All of their extensive growing information and products, like those fall seeds I was talking about, as well as their online garden planner, how-to videos, links to their active social media, and more are available on their website, territorialseed.com. And if you check them out right now, they're offering listeners 20% off with the code BLOOM20. So head to TerritorialSeed.com and check out their amazing educational offerings and seeds. I'll be growing their garlic and order something new to experiment growing this fall. Why not, right? Once again, that's code BLOOM20 at checkout at TerritorialSeed.com. And stay tuned till the end of this interview where I'll be sharing the Territorial Seed Fast Fall Gardening Fact. Okay, here's Lisa. Welcome back to Bloom and Grow Radio. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Lucky number three. We had to take a minute offline and figure out what other episodes we've talked because I feel like you and I chat every couple of weeks. So it's funny to remember what we've formally recorded together. Right. (laughs) African Um, violets. I couldn't remember that. (laughs) So for Bloom and Grow listeners, Lisa is joining us again for her third time on the show. The latest episode she did was an amazing review of African violets. And then also the low light, the very popular episode on best low light plants and how to deal with low light apartments and homes. So I'm so excited to have you back, Lisa, because I am thinking a lot about ferns right now, just personally because because my wedding bouquet is going to be all ferns. Oh. So I have a big fern inspiration board for my wedding. So I've been feeling more connected to ferns lately and also am a really intense fern killer, just (laughs) composted. I had a Boston fern for three years and I had kind of brought it to the brink of death and resuscitated it, brought it to the brink of death and resuscitated it. And actually was kind of like amazed at the resiliency of this fern because I feel like everybody thinks that ferns are so finicky, but this fern kept dying back, growing back, dying back, growing in, but I just composted it. So I hope that this conversation will get me inspired and get our community inspired to start caring for ferns again. Good. I love ferns. I don't know if you read my blog, maybe you've read about my great grandmother's fern that my mom received on in 1957 at her bridal shower. Right. And then I got some in 1984, 85 when I got married. And then I just gave a piece of it to my daughter in 2018 at her bridal shower. So we've had this fern. My mom's had it. I have her original now because she's not able to care for it. But 
I've had the same fern for mine for 35 years. So that's so beautiful. She's had hers for over 60. So it was great grandma's. We don't even know what kind it is. It's some sort of Boston fern, but it has the regular fronds on it. You know, that just have the leaflets. It looks like a mm-hmm. regular fern. And then it has really, really more different on the same frond. It's really crazy. That's Two amazing. That is like a classic heirloom plant story. Wow. And to have that additional wedding tie. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Please shoot me that link and we'll put the link to that blog in the show notes so people can listen and see the pictures of it. So I know that you've loved ferns. We've talked about that before. So let's just dive right in here (laughs) and talk about why people get so scared of ferns and ferns have been labeled as being such finicky plants. So can you kind of dive into why they're such an issue for people? Well, I'm going to be right up front and say I have killed my fair share of ferns, believe Mm -hmm. me. I think I'm on my fourth maiden hair in like a year (laughs) and I'm on crispy waves. I've killed those. So it's all a matter of, you cannot let them dry out. In my Mm -hmm. opinion, they have these really fibrous root systems that are kind of sensitive. And when you take them out of the pot, it's kind of weird to see if they're root bound because they're brown roots usually. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to actually see them. They just like look like they're part of the potting medium, but you've got to keep them watered. And I would have to say, I don't really raise the humidity too much. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I say they need a lot of humidity because they come from places where some of them, the tropical ones, it's 70% humidity. So they would like raised humidity. So you could set them on pebble trays. I have so many plants grouped together. There's lots of humidity where they're at because I have so many plants. And I think that also like everybody's like, I can't believe you have a Boston fern. You've had it for so long. Mine drops the front, you know, the little leaflets drop all over the floor. Mm -hmm. So do mine. Because that's what they naturally do. The oldest leaves of any plant are going to pass away. They're going to drop off. But for me, and sometimes a whole frond will die and it will just be leaflets everywhere on the floor. But it, because it's my grandmother's, it's worth it for me to clean it up. And mm-hmm. it's still a beautiful fern. And sometimes it does. Like you said, it kind of wanes and it might not look so great today. You know, in a month from now, it will look absolutely fabulous. So they can be finicky, but I think it's really the watering practices that make it that way. So maybe let's zoom out and talk about where ferns exist in the real world, in nature, and draw those parallels to how we can kind of recreate that indoors. So where do you find ferns? Well, the crazy thing is you can find ferns all over the whole world. Mm -hmm. You walk, take a walk in the New England woods or even woods here, and I live in Michigan, there's ferns everywhere. Mm Mm-hmm ferns all over the forest floor. I think you can go to the tropics and there's ferns. And what's really crazy is when you're in the trop, you know, like even in Florida or tropical places, you've got to look up in the trees because like bird's nest ferns and all those kind of footed ferns, they're epiphytes. So they're growing up in the crooks of trees and you may not know that that's what that is. Oh, wow. Because I've always thought of them as ground cover. I've never really thought of them as being in trees, but birds' nests really live in the trees, like birds' nests? (laughs) Yes. Yep. Birds' nest ferns. And also some of the, a staghorn fern. Of course, we all, you know, you've seen those mounted, those grow in trees. Some of those epiphytic, like the ones that creep and crawl, some of those Mm -hmm. are epiphytic as well. So they're everywhere. That's so interesting. So is there any common thread? I mean, I know that there's a wide variety of ferns that we can talk about today, but from what I've read, I recently like was asked about maidenhair ferns and they all live or thrive like near streams or bodies of water. And that makes sense to why their soil needs to be moist all the time and why like they will die if there's no water present. Is that kind of the case for all ferns? I think so. And what I've discovered is the thinner the leaf, you know how thin maidenhair ferns are, yeah, their so leaves, delicate. the thin, and then you have maybe the bird's nest that's more leathery. Mm-hmm. So they will take, you know, they'll dry out. They can take out like any plant, like compared to a succulent to any other plant. If the thicker the leaves, the, I wouldn't say less water, well, less water they need or the more succulent. tolerant they are of drying right. out a little bit. Uh huh. Right. So a maidenhair fern to me is I'm keeping one alive right now. It's out in my sunroom and I have not let it dry out one time. I'm out there like making sure it's watered all the time. And it's pretty humid out there, especially right now because it's mm-hmm. the summer in Michigan right now. It's like a steam bath. So it's doing very well in the house. Not always the same, but you know, a lot of ferns do better if you could put them in a big terrarium as well. Yeah. You know, terrariums, that's a great idea. So yeah, I think like with ferns, it's just important for us to understand they are loving humid 
environments that are close to water. And that is just like the polar opposite of our homes. So while some, a lot of other house plants that grow in the tropical jungle also have that environment, but they are hardier and these plants can just be a little trickier and they really do need that replication a little bit more than our pothos, you know, that's a little bit more drought tolerant or something like that. Right. And they do have those really fibrous small roots. So once Mm -hmm. you let them dry out, they're almost like all the roots that are like the feeder roots that are tiny. They're kind of like all the roots are like that. They don't have any like big fleshy roots that are sustaining them. Well, that's an interesting point because one of our Patreon plant friends wanted to ask, is there something about ferns root systems that make them more finicky? Well, they're more like the feeder roots or the hair roots. You know, they're very tiny. I mean, not that the, because really the, you know, you say that, but then maybe some people think that those, I call them footed ferns, mm-hmm. the ferns that have those creeping rhizomes like uh, rabbit's foot ferns. Mm-hmm. On top, they think those are maybe roots, but really those are stems. They're, and really all, I think most ferns have underground rhizome. They grow from a rhizome, but their roots are more like feeder roots. They're really tiny. They're really thin. They're brown and they don't want to be dried out. They're they delicate, don't, they don't, right? Yes. They're They're way more delicate. So if that soil dries out, those roots are also, it's just going to be so easy to break them too. Whereas those, the more plump, pink, juicier roots that we think about when we look at our philodendron or our pothos or our monstera, that's not what we're dealing with. So those can kind of sustain a little bit more dry. They're just sensitive, you know, they're just a little more sensitive. And I feel like the thing with ferns, like any plant that gets labeled is like, oh, I'm going to kill that. On the other side of this is succulents. It's not necessarily about a plant is going to be predisposed to be easier to kill. Like people say a succulent or people (laughs) say a fern. It's more about pairing that plant with the right personality. And the right place either in your home or wherever it needs to be. Absolutely. Like I always tell people, a succulent doesn't want to be in a low light situation and a fern doesn't want to be in a high light situation. You know, you have to have the right plant, right place. Because something cool about ferns is that they are low light tolerant. So a lot of us who struggle with low light, ferns could be a great option for people that live in basements or live, you know, with very little light, but you need to kind of up your watering game or, you know, do some hacks. So now that we understand where ferns exist outdoors, what are your fern care tips for if we do want to venture out into the world of ferns? I'm trying to muster up my own courage after I composted that uh, Boston fern that I told you about. So what are your fern care practices? you would suggest? I go by windows. I don't use light meters. So to me, east window is the perfect window for your ferns. Mm -hmm. I made sure I have good east windows because when I moved into this house, got to have east windows. They're all full of ferns because they like that morning light and they could take west, but if it's too close to the window, you know, that hot sun in the west in the Mm -hmm. afternoon is going to burn them. So you could Mm -hmm. put them back a little ways from a west window. I would not put them in a south window. I would not, unless it's back. I actually do have a rabbit's foot fern in a south window and it's about five feet from that south window. And believe me, that south window is already full of plants. So it's pretty Mm -hmm. shady and it's doing fine. It's a rabbit's foot fern. So this is the right plant, right place. Also north would probably be okay if, especially if it's got some reflecting light from a house next door or a building next door, I wouldn't say north with absolutely no light at all Mm -hmm. or shaded has an awning or anything like that. So make sure it has the right light, a nice, bright, medium light, soft light. Don't let them dry out. Obviously we already talked about that. So for new listeners who are in the Northern Hemisphere, Southern windows have the strongest light, Northern windows have the weakest light. So it goes strongest to South, second strongest is West because the sun sets in the West. So it gets burns a little hotter as it's setting. Third is East and fourth is North. So Lisa's saying the Eastern is perfect. So if you want to put a fern on a windowsill, you can put it on an Eastern. But if you're dealing with a stronger Western or Southern exposure, consider maybe putting that plant like a foot or two away from that windowsill. So like on whatever table is close to that window, giving it a little distance, right? Correct. And then, yes, if you're in the Southern hemisphere, that's the other way, then your North window would be your most intense light. What does burning look like? Is it just that like crispy edge? Well, I've seen people like on a bird's nest, you know, because the bird's nest fern has an actual leaf. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Not those little compound leaves that like mm-hmm. a regular fern. And you'll see like brown spots in the middle or the part that's closest to the window or the sun is going to okay. have burnt spots. Burnt edges could be just from not, you know, letting it dry out. Mm-hmm. Also, they are very sensitive to, like I said, we said they're sensitive. It, it can be damaged if you like over fertilized it or gave it a really, I wouldn't give a fern probably a full dose and probably most of my house plants, a full dose of fertilizer like I would outside. So mm-hmm. as a tablespoon outside, I would use half of that inside or whatever it says, teaspoon. I'd use half of it or even a third or a quarter of it for my ferns. 
So are you giving ferns half of what you give your other house plants or you're giving them no. half of what you give your outdoor house plants? Yeah, I want my outdoor plants. Yes. Your outdoor plants. Uh, any okay. anything that, you know, because a lot of fertilizers are just multi purpose fertilizers. Mm -hmm. And I would never use a full strength in the house. Of course. Unless, you know, you just don't need to. And with a fern, I might use like a quarter strength. Okay. Just to make sure I'm not burning those roots or. Yeah, that was another question. Is there some sort of fertilizer mix ratio that ferns prefer? We have a listener question. Is there a generic mix to go for? Is it specific to types of ferns? Our listener, Anne. You no, know, I've always just used a 20, 20, 20. Okay. Because we own a, a garden center. So we used to be Jack's Classic. Now it's called Peter's Professional. It's comparable to like miracle Grow because yeah. as a small garden center, we don't carry miracle Grow. Mm -hmm. You know, we carry the independent. So I don't think you have to buy anything that's specific to ferns. I think they probably ask that because, you know, when you go to the store, there's cacti and succulent fertilizer mm -hmm. and it has a lower nitrogen. And then I've never looked, I guess. I've never seen anything just for ferns. I just use a yeah. 20, 20, 20 straight across the board. And then you weaken it for all they of your house plants. Yes. I use a Spoma Organics liquid indoor fertilizer. So it's designed to be weaker than the outdoor fertilizer yeah. and it's liquid. It's so easy. And I use that on all my house plants. So I put that when my fern was thriving. That's what I, <laughs> that's what I should I try that. I haven't tried that, but I should do that. Oh, they make it so easy. The Because I love Espoma products. Yeah. We carry all those as well. Oh, that's awesome. Shout out to Espoma. <laughs> yeah. You know, all, all the tones. They yeah, have like the rose tone, flower tone, all yeah. those. We carry all those. They've we got it all. Wear by them. Yep. Okay. So with ferns, so let's talk about watering. So the soil must remain damp. Yes. I would not let them dry out. So what are your watering hacks? I mean, this is interesting because it's reminding me of our African violet conversation where you were suggesting those self-watering pots. I tried this self-watering crystal. It was like a glass thing that was in the shape of a crystal that you filled with water and then you put a cork in and then you put the cork side on the soil. So apparently the water was supposed to move through the cork onto the soil. Oh, I, tried that. I don't know if it didn't work or... So I was using it when my fern died. I don't know if I really was neglecting that fern pretty bad. So I don't know if it was that the water ran out and then the fern dried out or if it was that the water just didn't work. But what are your watering hacks for your ferns? I just water them by hand, but I have seen where people use the self-watering pots. And I'm thinking maybe I should, because those are usually, I've only seen them used for violets, but I don't know why that probably would work well for ferns so that it would never dry out. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking that would probably be a, be a very good, good way idea. to do it. Yeah. But I don't know if I'd use the wick. I, what you're talking about is kind of like those, you know, the balls that have the mm -hmm. glass like balls. Like a watering orb. Self-watering. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about that. Maybe that would work too. But I definitely think the wick watering would work great. Because yeah, that way those... you'd, never, you'd never let it dry out as long as you keep the water filled. The rotter right. reservoir filled. That's the, that's the key. Those wick watering things are interesting. And I feel like for me, I struggle there because... I like to check in on my plants. Like I would rather just water the fern every day because I like to check in on my plants. Even if I don't check in on them every day, I'm for the most part, you know, I have this personality test. It breaks down everybody into five different plant parent personalities. I'm for the most part, a mindful plant parent, but I'll have a week that I'll kind of forget. And so I like to generally water. The issue with these self-watering pots I personally am running into is I fill the pot up and then I forget about it because it's self-watering and then I don't check it and the water's been dried out for like two weeks and the plant is dead oh. because like the self-watering pot is made to be low maintenance, but because all my pots aren't on that schedule, like I forget about the one self-watering pot. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I would too. I yeah. forget about a lot of things. Yeah. As long as you keep it filled. Yeah. That's a great idea. But I just, uh -huh. you know, I make sure that they, I don't leave them standing in water or anything, mm -hmm. but like my boss, those big Boston ferns that I have that were my, you know, my mom's and mine, they're huge and they right. take a lot of water. Right. But what's good is that plants like that, I don't know if you've ever noticed with ferns, you can kind of look at them and see if they're dry. Mm -hmm. Like I can glance into ones in my, one of the bedrooms upstairs and I walk by it when I go down the stairs and I look over and if that fern is translucent, mm -hmm. it's a mint green, you know, it turns a lighter green. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh no, it's really dry. And thank oh, goodness so the it's leaf forgiving. the colors change. Definitely. Yes. Okay. So as the plant starts to pale, that's a sign, hey, Fine. you better water me. Definitely with ferns for sure. I can tell. I mean, I walk by, I'm like, oh no. And it takes, I could probably give that a good, almost a gallon of water. That's how much water it drinks. So it sounds like, do you think you can overwater a fern? Yes, because there's not a plant that's being grown in potting medium or soil that wants mm -hmm. to stand in water because then the roots are getting no oxygen. Mm -hmm. because it's so full of water. So yes, you can definitely overwater or kill a fern with water. You can't just leave them if sitting in water. If you let it like sitting in like a yep. pot of water because yes. you need that oxygen. But 
at the same time, if you're watering responsibly, you can probably give a fern. If you want to be a mindful plant parent and you want to have a plant that you water or like nurture every day, you could give a fern like a little bit of water every day, every other day. Now that brings up, what do you think about misting? I know a lot of people talk about misting, but misting does not, I think it's been proven you'd have to mist something every 15 minutes of 24 hours a day to make it Mm -hmm. worth your while. And I think it leaves too much. Once it dries up, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So I think the humidity trays or a humidifier is completely constantly giving it moisture. But also if you leave water sitting on the leaves too long, Mm -hmm. maybe you are going to mist it a lot. It could set it up to start growing some kind of disease. Right. Gray mold or botrytis or which is kind of the same thing. Fungal spots. I just don't, I don't use mist at anything. I never have. Yeah. I like misting just like for fun. Like if and, I yeah, want to just I do like tell give people my that plants some TLC. Right. Yeah. And it makes you feel good. And yeah, it's nothing wrong with it as long as it, it dries out, you know, but so yes. as long as it's not sitting on the leaves a lot. Yeah. And I think more effective for increasing humidity, like grouping some ferns together, grouping your plants together to create a little microclimate or using a humidifier is probably the better way to like, if you're trying to mist to increase humidity, I think those are better suggestions. I personally like don't really get the pebble. Did you say that you do the water with the pebble rock tray? On some plants I do. And I don't just set it on the pebbles. Let's say you have a plant in a four inch pot with a saucer that's proportionate. So a four Mm -hmm. inch plant saucer. Then I would use like a six, eight or 10 inch bigger saucer that's Mm -hmm. filled with pebbles, filled with water up to the top of pebbles. And I set that saucer on top of the pebbles, not just set the plant so that there would be a chance of it actually standing in water. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So it's two saucers. So this hack for people who haven't heard of it is there's one of these common like garden things that people have been talking about, even in the plant care books from the seventies that I used to read is you put your potted plant on a layer in the base tray. You put a layer of pebbles and you cover those pebbles up to the brim with water. And the thought is that water is going to slowly evaporate and create a little microclimate of higher humidity around your plant. And I feel like people have different opinions about it. And what Lisa is saying is instead of doing that, you're actually putting another saucer on top of that pebble tray and then the pot on top of that to prevent potential root rot with having that pot stand in water. That's really smart. Yes. And then also give them a shower Mm -hmm. if you can. You know, I have a lot of plants, so I don't move them all to the shower, but all my bedroom plants get put in the shower just to get the dust off. To get, I have cat, I use all my cat hair off it. And it just really refreshes them. So especially ferns, you know, if you want to put them in, give them a nice shower once in a while, put them in their sink with a sink sprayer. They're going to love that. I'm such a fan of a plant shower, especially yeah. too, just for getting the dust and cleaning the leaves. It's yeah. especially a plant that has a lot of leaves. It's just the easier thing to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's easy to go wipe to all those leaves down. Yeah. yeah. If you have a fiddly fig, you may not take you long to wipe all those big leaves, but if you had a fern, that would take you Exactly. Hours. <laughs> That's where I'm really sold on the process. Yeah. And you'd be surprised to know that ferns can also get, like I've been fighting mealybugs on mine Mm -hmm. and they're sensitive. So you really can't spray them too much. Mm -hmm. You know, like I wouldn't go out and buy some huge insecticide and spray my, well, I don't with any of my plants, but you'd have to use a systemic because they're kind of prone to getting scale too, brown scale. Are they really? I didn't know that. Once they get it. I've had a heart's tongue fern had that. Bird's nests have had that. I've actually had some on my rabbit's foot fern on the stems. Mm Mm-hmm. So that can be a problem scale, uh, mealybugs, which are hard to get rid of. How do you like to treat those? I try to get them off first. I'm always a big fan of like, you know, even on the stem, well, if, if, especially if it's a, like a rabbit's foot fern, they have that long brown stem. You can kind of get them off there. Use a Q-tip with alcohol, which you have to be careful. But I think a systemic mm-hmm. work well. And, you know, I've never done this because I'm afraid, uh, especially with grandma's plant, like something happens to it. But I do have more. I have, I have the original now. I have mine. So I have a few of them and I've started a few. So I could, but a lot of those ferns, you can just cut them off at the ground. I would do this in the spring, not in the fall, and they'll come back up. It's amazing. Kind of amazing. I know. I've done that. Yeah. So if you really have a bad case and it's a plant, like grandma's, you don't want to get rid of. I'm not giving this up. It's not going to the compost pile. I can't. So then I would probably use a systemic, which I know in other countries, like I know Mm -hmm. Canada, there's no such thing as systemics. They do not sell them. What is a systemic when you're- A systemic is a chemical that you put, and I use bonide systemic houseplant control this one's a granular product and you sprinkle it on the soil. It tells you how much to use. Like, you know, if it's this size pot, use this many, this much a teaspoon, or if this size pot, use a tablespoon or whatever. And you spread it around. I kind of, I have an old fork that I only use for that. And I scratch it in 
and then I water it in. And that Mm -hmm. chemical goes down into the root system, comes back up through the plant. And when the bugs eat it, they die. Oh, that's, that's systemic. What a systemic it goes through is. the whole system of the plant. What okay. they call it the systemic. And very there are spray systemics, which is weird, but ferns are very, like you said, they're sensitive. I wouldn't, it, you have to test a product on a leaf. Because like the other day, I just did a post. You know how when you get plants, and especially like I had a bird's nest, and it gets, it has those little water spots on it, those white mm-hmm. spots, and you try to wipe them off with just water and they don't come off. Mm-hmm. It's so unsightly. I hate it. And it's usually from fertilizer, like from the greenhouse fertilizer residue, like the salt residue, or just hard water minerals that get on the, that stay on the plant. So you use lemon, use a lemon juice or a, just a lemon slice and wipe it off. And I was a little concerned about using it on a fern because I never had, but I did it. And I always rinse it off afterwards. I don't just leave the lemon juice on there. Mm-hmm. And it really did work and it did not hurt the plant at all. So. I read your post about that. I thought that was such a fun, like old school gardening hack. So and it was. Try the lemon. I will tell you that was from Elvin McDonald, who if you've looked at old house plant books, Elvin has written, I don't know, 40, 50 of them. So, so he knows what he's talking about. Yes. And he edited my first book. So he was like, use a lemon. Because I said, don't use anything on your plants, just water and a sponge. Don't use that plant shine or any of that goop. You don't need it. And he's like, oh, you can use a lemon. I'm like, oh, really? So it works. That's awesome. <laughs> And it didn't well, hurt the plant. We'll put the link to that blog in the show notes as well so people can check it out. So, okay, Lisa, let's talk about spores. I just don't get them. They're these creepy little dots. So <laughs> ferns just kind of regenerate or I guess propagate differently. So please tell me, what is a spore? <laughs> okay, so first of all, the biggest question I get from ferns is I have little brown dots on it. Oh my gosh, it's an insect. Right. What am I going to do? So this is what I tell people. If it's on the stem of the front or the leaf, mm-hmm. called a blade, the entire thing is called a blade. If it's on the stem, it is scale. Because scale, it does get, you know, ferns are very prone to getting scale. Mm-hmm. If it's on the front of the leaf, like it the is top. scale. The top, okay. the top of the leaf, it is scale. If you turn it over and it's covered with brown, they're usually in a pattern. <laughs> mm-hmm. Then it's their spores. And it can be in lines too. Some plants like a bird's nest are in lines like a chevron, you know, Mm -hmm. like a a zigzag. And then there's some like the rake ferns, the terrace ferns, they kind of like outline the back of the leaf. It's kind of beautiful. It is beautiful. And then Mm -hmm. there's some that are just polka dots. They're polka dots, but they're always on the back of the leaf, never on the front, never on the stem. That's how you know it's not a scale. So we got that out of the way. Okay. This is how they reproduce themselves. And it's a very complicated process. I have never done it in my own home. I don't do a lot of propagating because I have so many plants. Mm -hmm. Like, ah, so I don't do a lot of propagating. But they take the fern, you have to take the spores and you have to spread them in a very sterile environment is number one. I tell people never microwave your soil. Don't use outside garden soil. Don't bake your soil. It smells. But if you want to propagate your plant from spores, you do need to either bake it or microwave it. I'm not going to tell you how because I've never done it, but you Mm -hmm. can look that up. So you do have to have a very sterile environment. You have to be sterile. Your pots have to be sterile that you use and you spread them on this moist soil. So they have to have water and that's maybe that's why ferns are usually near water or in a very humid area or a place that rains a lot because they have to have water to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So they make these little tiny, they first start out and they're called gametophytes. That's what becomes what the first comes from these spores. Like a baby fern. Yeah. Well, it is, but it's shaped like a weird, it's kind of like almost like a flat green thing. Okay. And it kind of almost looks like a lichen or something, Mm -hmm. but it's not. And then that has to have water. And then that's what makes the sperm and the egg. And that has to have water for that to swim over there. Okay. Then it starts like maybe five months to a year later, then you'll have that plant that looks like a fern, but it starts out not looking like a fern. So and everything the, has to be very sterile. You have to have it covered. It has to be very moist and you have to have some patience. So when our ferns grow, like when my Boston fern, like it would get bushier and bushier, is that that the spores are falling off the bottoms of the leaves onto the soil and then generating and making new ferns? No, because okay. I personally, and I've never looked this up, but I've never had spores on my Boston fern. Okay. One, Cause I don't think moms. I had spores on mine either. No they spread like by rhizomes and some of those rhizomes, those footed ones, those are ones that have long rhizomes and spread out. Uh, Then there's ones that their rhizomes are smaller and they become more clumpy ferns like the Boston Mm -hmm. fern. And then they send out those little stolons. Have you ever seen those strings hanging down? 
Mm -hmm. So I've started some of those and then they will start growing ferns on them. I had them hanging off mom's fern and there was like four or five of those little baby that were already three or four inches high hanging off those stolons. So those look like kind of like hair or strings hanging off your fern. And then you can just either, what I did is I took a pot of soil I set it next to the mom fern and I pinned those little baby still attached to the mom by those stolons Mm -hmm. until they started growing and then I cut it off and now it's its own fern. So it just depends. There's different ways. And you can also like a Boston fern, you can divide it. You know, it has has multiple, what do you want to say? Multiple plants in one pot, Mm -hmm. you know, it makes it, that's how it grows. So then you can divide it. So Okay. But back to the essence of what spores are. So spores are the dots that are on the bottom of the plants and they're what grows new ferns. But as plant parents, we don't have to worry about them that much. Just don't scrape them off. Right. And what you're really seeing is the spores are really microscopic. So those little dots are called sori and they're the clusters. They're what grow the spores inside of them. So that's kind of like a little house full of a million Interesting. Okay. And then the thought is that's those spores are what grow new, but that's not what's happening. Our new growth of our ferns, like if you cut a fern back and then more grow, that's coming from the root system, what's going under the soil. Right. So really, actually, those are really sporangias and then clusters of sporangias. Like if you have a whole leaf full of them, those are the Mm -hmm. sori or sori, sori. So it's, you know, there's different names, but all those little tiny, they're just like little houses. And each one of those little dots has probably, I don't even know how many spores inside. That's so cool. I read online that like if your fern produces spores, it's actually a sign that it's really happy. So to like just take it as like, you know, a little pat on the shoulder. Yes. Yes. That's a good way to look at it. I like that. <laughs> so, and a lot of times when you're potting them up, a lot of people just start them like in peat moss, like solid mm-hmm. peat moss or something, maybe with a little bit of vermiculite and perlite. But it's all about too, what I've read is all about being very sterile. Mm-hmm. It has to be sterile to get that to work, which then you think, well, outside it surely isn't sterile, but mm-hmm. you know, that's nature doing its thing. Right. Inside, we have to do it differently. Well, that's funny you bring that up because I feel like things that happen in nature naturally that like we try and replicate inside that are so hard, like you talk about spore generation. There's that hysterical meme that's like trying to keep a maiden hair fern alive indoors. Like I spritz you every day. I have the humidifier. I'm watering you every day and you still hate me and you still die. And then like the other side of the meme is like a maiden hair fern growing out of like a crack in a rock, like needing nothing and thriving. Exactly. I mean, I really do think it's humidity, but it's also, you just can't let them dry out. Yeah. And I've done it and it doesn't, it's like a minute. I swear it's, if it's dry for a minute and it wilts, you're like, oh, I mean, they don't another come back. Another one bites the dust. Yes. Another <laughs> one bites the dust. Like, I keep trying. I brought one home the other day and it's been, I will know a while ago and it's out in my sunroom mm-hmm. and I do not let it dry out and it's really humid out there and it's knock on wood. I'm knocking on wood. It's thriving. <laughs> so. so I'd love to hear your favorite ferns that you would recommend in general. And then I'd love to ask you a couple of different plant parent personalities and what fern you might pair with them. Okay. So what ferns do you think make great houseplants? So the fern that I wrote about that I have, and I said it's, and I actually named the blog fern for the fern challenged Mm -hmm. is the austral gem fern. Okay. It literally looks like plastic. Okay. I mean, it will, of course it looks like a fern, but it's just like so shiny and kind of rubbery. And I have dried that out. It is whoop, down and drooping and it comes right back. Okay. Now it may have some brown fronds on it or some ends because there's, I tell people there's always consequences to everything, something that you do wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, you've let a plant dry out. There's always going to be consequences. That's what I say. So it does give you a little bit of brown fronds, but it comes right back and it's crazy. It doesn't need water as much as the other plants because it really just feels like rubber. You bring up a good question. What do you recommend with brown fronds? Like just chop them off and trust that yeah. more will grow, come in. Because I've gotten them on the ends of my bird nest ferns and stuff too. And I always just trim them. I don't just trim them, cut them off straight. I try to trim my leaves whenever they have a problem. I try to trim them the shape that they were before. Mm-hmm. So I kind of do that rounded edge. But yeah, just cut them off. Oh, that's, that's cool. Fine. I mean, or leave them on. It's up to you. <laughs> I mean, I would like almost kill my Boston fern and it would be like 75% brown. And then I would just cut off all the brown parts and then like all this new green growth would grow in. That's I why I'm it. like, I don't know if they're that. I mean, yeah, they're hard to keep perfect looking, but they're actually rather hardy or at least some are. I'm not talking about maiden hair ferns, but. You know, a lot of people have Boston ferns because they buy them outside for their porch or their, mm-hmm. what, and they get so full and gorgeous and it's so hard to throw them out. So they bring them in. And I tell them when you bring a plant in from outside, 
outside and it's coming from however many thousands of foot candles to your maybe 100, 200 foot candles in your house. So Mm -hmm. I just say that because I don't measure them, but I'm just saying that's what it is outside. And you bring them in. A plant is only going to keep the leaves that it can sustain with the light that it is receiving. Mm -hmm. Whatever light it's getting, that's all the food it has to feed itself. So if it can't feed itself, what's it going to do? It's going to drop those leaves leaves. that it cannot support. So Mm -hmm. it seems like when you bring in a big old fabulous Boston fern and it has 20 million leaflets and then 1,999 million of them end up on the floor, Mm -hmm. you're like, oh, forget it. But it's just, you need to acclimate it. But you also have to realize that I like to start with them inside and leave them inside. My mom's fern's never been outside. So it's used to my situation. It's used to where it's at. It doesn't move and it loves it. You find the place a plant loves, I leave it there. I don't take it outside and bring it back in. I don't know if you watch Will and Grace, but they have the most epic Boston fern in their apartment. And every time I watch the show, I'm like, that fern must be fake because that Boston fern looks so perfect. And There's sometimes no- you can tell when there is a brown leaf. So then yeah. you know, because mm-hmm. someone will say, is that a fake leaf? And then I'll walk up to him like, well, they make them so realistic now, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have any brown leaves or brown edges. So it can't be real. <laughs> yeah. So funny. <laughs> it's too real. But it could be, you know, and they could just switch it out every well, time. So- go buy a new Boston fern and put it on the set. Totally. So you mentioned the Australian gem fern. That's one that well, sounds... Austral. It's just called Austral. Oh, Austral. A-U-S-T-R-A-L. Austral gem Sorry. fern. I had the botanical name. It is an asplenium. Let's put a list in the show notes, but the Austral okay. gem fern sounds like a yep. great fern option for like more of a low maintenance plant parent. Yes. Then for the mindful plant parent, plant parent that wants to, you know, water every day, give it a lot of TLC, obviously maiden hair comes... Yes, that rotten maiden hair fern. The rotten maiden hair. <laughs> oh, and a button fern. A button a, fern. Oh, those button ferns are so cute. That's the one that's Pel- Pelea. P- I don't know how to say it. I'm not very good mm-hmm. with these Latin names. P-E-L-L-A-E-A. Mm-hmm. Rotundifolia. That's the one. But there's also the lemon button fern, which kind of looks like it, but it is actually a nephrolepis. It's actually a, in the Boston fern family. So, so there's it's two a little different. hardier. There's lemon button fern and there's button fern. And I found those both the button fern and that one. You better not let them dry out. Okay. I have killed many a button fern. <laughs> okay. So those, but beware of the button ferns. So those yeah. would be perfect for a mindful plant parent that wants to look at them every day. Yes. Every day. You know what I do with my plants that need water every day? They're right by my sink, underneath the counters, under lights, which my husband can, hates it. So smart. I have lights underneath my cupboards. So smart. Aquarium lights. And those are the ones that. that I'm right there watering a sink. And it, so even if they faint or they're a little you bit know. dry, I'm always at the sink, right? You right. see there at least 10 times a day, you're not going to miss it. Oh, that's so smart. What about for our curious collector plant parents, people that like to collect like more unique? Everybody talks about the Boston fern, the bird's nest fern, staghorn fern. What's like a kind of more unique fern that maybe not everybody has? Like something that comes to mind for me is that like bear's paw, rabbit's foot, whatever those wacky ferns are. I have all of those. I love those. I just got some, I was at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show and Andy's orchids was there and I brought home ferns in my bag. I'm like, I have to have these. And they were weird ferns I'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. So you can find them out there and, but they're in an aquarium upstairs. I'm not letting anything Mm -hmm. happen to those, but you know what is out right now? And it's out in the, and I saw it two years ago at the tropical plant show. It's called the Nicholas diamond fern. Okay. It's a cross between a phlebodium and a pyrosia. It is so gorgeous. It has roughly leaves. It's just, that's a really great fern to look for. And it's my daughter saw one at Lowe's the other day. So they're out in, you know, it's not something you Mass be able to find. I got one at a garden, an independent garden center, which I suggest everyone go to first, mm-hmm. but she did see it. It's out there, but it's a really cool, unique new fern. I mean, it stopped me in my tracks two years ago at the tropical plant show. And they're like, wow, you're good. I'm like, what is that? And they would not sell it to me. <laughs> like, I really need that. So that's a new, cool new fern. But you know what also is, you know how they have the fern allies, you know, plants that really aren't ferns, but they're kind of like a fern because they reproduce by spores is the lycopodiums, which okay. I think now are called, they have another name that starts with an H, but anyway, you would still fund it under lycopodium. Mine is so cool. And that is my plant that I tell my husband, if I'm gone and something happens to that plant, you're in big trouble because <sighs> it's hard to find. I've grown it from a single little stalk and now it's cascades. It's beautiful. I'm like, don't ever let anything happen to that. So, but that, even though it's not a fern, it's kind of a fern ally. And that's mm-hmm. a really cool, another whole group of plants to get into. Yeah. Like you say, the big bear's paws ferns are really cool. The can so- fern. I like all those footed ferns. Yeah, I like that you call them footed ferns. You know, mm-hmm. they're, I didn't even realize they were ferns because they almost look like they have a little stalk with then this big leaf that looks like a paw. I mean, I've seen them in Trader Joe's now, like in Whole Foods and 
they're pretty well circulated as well, but they're gorgeous. Some of them almost yeah. have like a blue undertone to their leaves. Yeah. The blue star one, that's really pretty. Oh, they're but It's gorgeous. also called like a bear paws too. So are those more hardy or those need the super, super humidity too? Oh no, mine do well. Some of them are have thinner and more delicate leaves, kind of like the rabbit's foot. But some of them, like that big bear's paw fern I have, I mean, the bear's paw or the rhizome, they're really rhizomes. So above, these are modified stems that the fronds come out of. They are, mine is probably an inch and a half to two, probably about an inch and a half around. It's huge mm-hmm. and it's fuzzy. So that's why it's called bear's paw. And the leaves that come out of there are pretty leathery. So mm-hmm. it's pretty forgiving. Oh, you I know? love it. That's, yeah, I remember not as bad. When I was in DC with cats, I bought I think it was a bear's paw fern at Trader Joe's and I brought it home and it like did great and I wasn't super high maintenance about it and then I've gifted it to a friend who travels a lot and it's still thriving too like she hasn't killed it either. So I think that's a really interesting suggestion and also for like a design based plant parent which is someone who picks plants for like their aesthetic. I think those are just gorgeous, wild looking plants. Like the structure of their leaves are so unique and cool in the color. If you're ever at Longwood Gardens, if you walk down their fern, I guess it's like a hallway, but Mm -hmm. it's, you know, still part of a greenhouse. They have ones hanging from the ceiling that are as big around as bigger than like a big beach ball, huge. Mm -hmm. And they're just crawling with all those little feet. I have a rabbit's foot fern that has wrapped itself around the pot and I had it sitting next to my like, kitchen table. And my sister-in-law turned around and literally like jumped because she thought it was a tarantula. <laughs> I mean, she's like, oh my God. Like if she knew me, she knew it wasn't a tarantula because I hate spiders. I mean, I don't hate oh, them. That's awesome. I just am, I just don't particularly care for them in my house and I wouldn't have a tarantula in my house. But you know, that's what it looks like. It's just so weird. So yeah, those are definitely plants for people that like more unique, weird plants. Oh, that's awesome. We can't have a fern episode and not talk about the staghorn fern. For people who are listening who don't know what it is, the staghorn fern you normally see, it looks like antlers. A lot of people say it's like vegan antlers and people mount them on wood a lot, but it's this wacky thing. The leaves look like antlers and then it's got this huge like weirdo dome. It almost looks like a mushroom cap kind of that you then kind of mount. So talk to me about staghorn ferns and care with them because that's kind of a whole different game. I feel like. Those are two different kinds of fronds. So the green ones that look like the antlers. And I also wrote a blog post about that, about the only antlers that I would want on my wall. Cool. Because I have relatives that, you know, have those of real antlers. antlers right? on, yes, on the wall. So I did take a picture at their house and I'm like, this is what you could have, but these are the antlers I would want on my wall. And so those are two different fronds. So the green fronds that come out, well, that, you know, that look like antlers, those are the sterile fronds or the ones that make the spores. Those are mm-hmm. the fronds that can reproduce. And then those brown ones would start out green. Mm -hmm. They're called basal fronds. And they're what attach them to, as they grow epiphytically in the jungle, into the tree. Mm -hmm. That's what collects the nutrients for them. Like if it's growing on a tree in the forest, they'll, or, you know, in the rainforest, like debris will fall in there behind those fronds because they're kind of like scales, you know, they overlap each other and stuff can get in between. And that's where, how they get their nutrients in, out in the wild or whatever you want to say, out in nature. So those are two different kinds of fronds. And when they turn brown, you should not remove those because, you know, we all think if it's a brown, something brown, we should remove it. But those fronds, they come out green and then they turn brown and they just keep building on each other because it can become huge and massive. You do not cut those off. So one of our Patreon listeners, Christy, says that the shields of my staghorn fern die off as soon as a new one starts growing. Is this normal for young staghorn ferns? Yes. If she's talking about those things that are holding it on, those rounded basil ferns, yes, Mm -hmm. they are natural for them to turn brown. That's what they do. And so she says, oh yeah, they die. So you're saying leave them on. Yes. Because I don't know if they're actually dead when they're brown. I guess they probably are because then they're growing new ones, but those are what holds that fern on and what's it's collecting debris and stuff and gotcha she also said a beautiful elk staghorn i have died because a family of slugs took up residence behind the shield and i couldn't get them out i don't know if i should have pulled it off the board what do you do when you get pests behind those i guess she's calling it a shield or those fronds yeah those are shield ferns that's another good way to say it basil fronds shield fronds that yeah they shield i probably would have taken it off yeah and got Mm -hmm. rid of them somehow and got rid because a lot of people when they mount them they use sphagnum moss to mount Mm -hmm. them at first onto a board which i've done so then you just need to soak that so i take it to the shower and take it or i'll if i'm in the greenhouse i'll take it outside and use a hose and really soak that or sometimes take it to the laundry sink and soak it or to the shower and soak that sphagnum moss that's holding those they've tied it on with fish line until it gets attached and then you know it's attached by itself 
Those are not gotcha. that don't let dry out, but I guess I would have taken it off. Yeah. And gotten rid of them. Yeah. Okay. And they are also prone to scale. I mean, you can get scale I bet. on a staghorn fern. So I want to hit you with a couple more listener questions and then we'll wrap up because I can't believe we've been chatting for almost an hour. Well, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> let's, no, it's my, it's always my fault. I'm the, such a chatterbox. I, me too. So bird's nest ferns are something we see at every plant shop. I feel like they're so readily available. Those are the ones that look like they have real leaves and they're in this like beautiful spiral. So we have a listener that Jamie says, what's the best way to water a bird's nest fern and how can you make it grow big? So I think with growing big, I have one, like I said, all my bird's nest ferns right now, I have the crispy wave. I have Chrissy, Leslie, the regular bird's nest. And I just got one called, and I had to call central Florida ferns. I sent them a picture because I didn't know what it was. It didn't have any kind of tag and it's like got jagged edges. It's Mm -hmm. something I'd never seen. It's called the champion bird's nest fern. All of those are on my count, on the counter underneath those lights. And my regular bird's nest fern is getting huge. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh man, what am I going to do with this? So I think it's more light, you know, really good light. Got I don't it. let it dry out because it's right there. Mm-hmm. And it has dropped, you know, the bottom leaves are going to die as it gets older, which is fine. Do you prune those off? I do. Okay. And also I found when I, because it's, there's a lot of plants everywhere it's on my counters. I was only watering the side that was closest to me. Mm-hmm. And it felt like, and the other side was completely dry. So I want to remind people to always water your plant all the way around. And with a bird's nest fern, you should only be watering around the outside. I have watered one consistently in the middle where that little mm-hmm. nest is and it rotted it and my, all the fronds fell off and it died. So even though, you know, you're saying, well, out in the nature, it would be getting water inside that, right? But I've said that they, I don't say, but it, they naturally grow as epiphytes. So any epiphyte that's grown on a tree, air plants, you know, like the air plants, the tillandsias, ferns, they're never growing straight up. Phalaenopsis orchids, they're never mm-hmm. growing straight up and down. Mm, I'm growing on a slant so that water drains out. And you're just having like still water sit in the bottom. Right. And because plant. we're growing plants straight up and down mm-hmm. in a pot, that's not natural for them to be watered in the middle. And I don't know if you've ever rotted a Phalaenopsis orchid, but I have too, because you left that water sitting in the middle. And normally that would be on the side and air plants the same way. They don't want to have water sitting in the middle unless it's a a tank bromeliad. But anyway, that's another story. (laughs) So get under those leaves. Get under the leaves and water all the way around and just try not to let water sit in that middle. I ordered the sexiest watering can from Folia Collective's website when they went online in the middle of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It has the skinniest little spout and it gets under everything. And I love it. House Plant Journal also has a really sexy watering can. Like I just love a really skinny spouted watering can. I probably can't even tell you how many watering cans I have in this house. I know me too. I I buy all those little copper ones I see. I just bought one the other day with copper and has a little, you know, the copper spray head on it. Uh It's just so cute. But the one I use the most has a really long spout. And it's mm-hmm. been, and it's plastic. I've had it for years. I don't know what kind it is, but it's my favorite one. And it, yeah, because you can get way in with the plants. That's awesome. One of our awesome Patreon listeners, Michael, wants to know, he just got his first tree fern, which he's so excited about. And he's wondering how can he propagate tree ferns? I've had a tree fern. Don't let that dry out, Michael. Or it will be gone. <laughs> they don't ever want to dry out. And actually, I've read that even their stems want to be like they, you should miss those. They like the stems don't want to dry out because mm-hmm. they grow in like New Zealand and Australia and it's right. naturally humid or whatever they Super going humid. on. But I would wait for offsets. I think I don't know another way okay. to propagate that. Like wait for it to make grow, babies and then grow an offset. cut it apart. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then one more tips for raising a tiny Aslenium bulbiferum hen and chickens fern. The baby yep. spawns on the fronds. I've tried propagating in potting mix or sphagnum moss, but they die and don't root. What am I doing wrong? I have a packet of fern spores. What's your advice for growing fern spores? Well, we talked about the fern spores. You have to put them in sterile medium, cover them up, put them in a good light, but not full sun and wait for those little gametophytes to mm-hmm. start growing. And, and it then, sounds like it's going to take a really long process. So you might. Well, it can anywhere from six to months to a year to get a, that's what I read, to get a fern. Right. So, so that's buckle a up. Thought. But the Asplenium bulbiferum, I love that. It's called the mother fern. And if you've ever seen one, it looks like a kind of a frilly fern. And then little babies grow along the fronds. Mm-hmm. And eventually they'll drop off, you know, in nature and start growing. So I've had people give them to me before and I've killed them too. So I understand, but I finally got one to grow and I have one right now and I should do a blog post about it. I started it in a little tiny jar because they're little tiny, these little bulb, bulb, bulbs. I don't know what they're exactly called. They're just tiny little babies and they have like a little bulb on the bottom. I put it in the jar and I close the lid mm-hmm. and like a terrarium, I grew it in a terrarium and now 
I've moved up to the, you know, those enormous pickle jars. That's mm-hmm. how big it is right now. Oh, wow. So what's, so, your, and what are your tips for that? It's to grow it in a terrarium, some in kind of terrarium. enclosed little jar. Yep. Cause I tried it and it. Yes. Especially when they're that little. Terrariums are a great idea. I am very curious. I want to challenge myself to try maidenhair ferns. I've never had one before. I'm really interested in trying it. And I think I'm going to try it in the terrarium route. I think that's the way to do it. Mine's doing well, but like I said, it's right now it's like in a great big terrarium because it's out in my greenhouse and it's yeah. humid here in Michigan, like dripping wet. So, right. and I haven't let it dry out. So it's we'll doing really well. Goes. Yeah. Well, plant friends, tell us what you want to challenge yourself with and what ferns you end up getting and tag me and Lisa, Lisa's house plant guru on Instagram, and let us know what ferns you grow after talking about this episode. Before we go, you have a new book. Lisa, I do. So tell us about your new book. The links for it are going to be in the show notes. Everybody, I know we have so many members in our community that have bought Grow in the Dark, your book on low light house plants. You have amazing recommendations and several ferns in there. So what's this new book? Tell us all about it. The new book is called House Plant Party. Okay. <laughs> so it has a small amount, like 15 or 16 plants, but then it has a lot of projects. Cool. And we're doing some recycling projects. We're macrame. We're making different kinds of plant hangers for your plants, plant shelves, air plant, air plant shadow boxes, all kinds of fun things. How perfect for this moment of quarantine. People are home yes. and they need some yes. planty DIYs to do. Yeah. And they're, they're really geared to, well, they're geared to anyone. I mean, anybody can do them, but I think they could go as low as, you know, if you have a really crafty young 10, 11 year old, I they could certainly do many of the projects in there, even the younger probably. Oh, that's so fun. Well, I can't wait to check it out and do some DIY projects from it myself in my new home because I've got a lot of new space for my new, for more DIY projects. So I can't wait to check it out. The link will be in the show notes. And where can everyone find you? You have so many amazing blogs. I'm on your email list. I read your blogs when you send emails once a week. So where can everyone find you to keep learning from you? Anything, the houseplant guru. So my website is theHouseplantGuru.com. I'm the houseplant guru on Facebook and Instagram. So anywhere awesome. you can find me. <laughs> cool. Go tell Lisa hi. And I can't wait to have you back for episode number four that we do together in sometime in the future. Thank you. And good luck on your new move and your new home. How fun. More oh places for plants. <laughs> I know. For more ferns. We're trying again. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, so much for all of that amazing info. It makes me want to go to the garden center and buy every fern. Like I said, I think I'm going to try a maidenhair fern once we've got one more move to make. We're in temporary housing. So once we get settled up, I think I'm going to try a maidenhair fern in a terrarium. And then I gifted that paw fern that I was telling you about, but I really liked it. So I think I might find another one. You can find Lisa, like she said, at Houseplant Guru and check the link in the show notes to buy her new book. That DIY book sounds like so much fun, especially for all of this isolation (laughs) moments, all of these social distanced moments. I really hope that I hear your voicemails about your favorite episode or your favorite lesson learned. Like I said, all the links are in the show notes, and there's a separate episode dedicated to that announcement with details on exactly how to do it and tips. Make sure you check that out. And find me on Bloom and Grow Radio on Instagram all week next week. We are partying with the IG Lives with all of my plant friends and that epic giveaway. It is so epic, like so much money worth of product from all of our sponsors you've heard about. Thank you so much to our Patreon plant friends. I'm so thankful for you to be supporting the show. And I am really excited to be actually announcing next week some extra fun stuff that we're going to be doing with Patreon this year. And thank you to Territorial Seed for sponsoring today's show. So Territorial Seed Company and I came up with a really fun thing at the end of the episodes they're sponsoring. We're going to offer you guys a Territorial Seed Fast Fall Gardening Fact. So their Fast Fall Gardening Fact today is... That fall and winter grown collard greens are sweet, tender, and also really big. Those leaves get really big, so you can harvest those individual leaves, trim out the main rib, and then you can use them like tortillas for wraps. So you can fill those collard green leaves with your favorite sandwich or burrito fixings, wrap it up, and create your own healthy and portable treat. So consider growing your own collard greens this year and to go get your collard green seeds and garlic and amazing other fall winter vegetables. Head to TerritorialSeed.com and use code BLOOM20 at checkout for 20% off.
Plan friends, the next time you hear my voice, it's going to be at our 100th episode. I'm so excited. It's going to be a big party next week, like I said. So I can't wait to celebrate you and celebrate with you all week next week. Until then, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friends, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you are subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're making sure you're subscribed, why don't you head on over to the review section of whatever podcast player you're tuning into and leave us a review. I would greatly appreciate it. If you are interested in more fun and educational planty content, well, plant friend, I've got a whole lot for you. Subscribe to the Bloom and Grow YouTube show, which is my YouTube channel where I bring you along for my personal plant journey, as well as share informational content that pairs with our podcast episodes. Follow me at Bloom and Grow Radio on Instagram for behind the scenes, sneak peeks at upcoming episodes, my daily planty lessons and thoughts, and most importantly, tune into my Instagram stories where I am constantly talking with you listeners and plant friends and polling you for content ideas and I'm always interested in seeing what you're loving these days on Instagram. Join the Bloom and Grow mailing list and get a free download of the Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print that she created exclusively for our community. And if you can, support Bloom and Grow Radio by becoming a plant friend on Patreon. For as little as $4 a month, you not only help me bring these planty and informative episodes to thousands of ears around the world, but you will also get the super secret planty password to our exclusive Bloom and Grow Radio Garden Club Facebook group, which is a wonderfully active group of plant friends of the Bloom and Grow Radio podcast who make up what I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. It is a lot of fun over there. And as always, my sweet plant friends, I am here for you. If you have ideas for episode topics, guests, or if you're possibly a business interested in sponsoring the show, reach out to me because I am here to help all of you keep blooming and keep growing.